Part One of Prose Romances from the Oxford and Cambridge Magazine, from Prose and Poetry, eighteen fifty six to eighteen seventy, by William Morris. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Story of the Unknown Church, Oxford and Cambridge Magazine, January eighteen fifty six. I was the master mason of a church that was built more than six hundred years ago. It is now two hundred years since that church vanished from the face of the earth. It was destroyed utterly. No fragment of it was left, not even the great pillars that bore up the tower at the cross, where the choir used to join the nave. No one knows now even where it stood. Only in this very autumn tide, if you knew the place, you would see the heaps made by the earth-covered ruins heaving the yellow corn into glorious waves so that the place where my church used to be is as beautiful now as when it stood in all its splendour i do not remember very much about the land where my church was i have quite forgotten the name of it but i know it was very beautiful and even now while i am thinking of it comes a flood of old memories and i almost seem to see it again that old beautiful land only dimly do i see it in spring and summer and winter but i see it in autumn tide clearly now yes clearer clearer oh so bright and glorious yet it was beautiful too in spring when the brown earth began to grow green beautiful in summer when the blue sky looked so much bluer if you could hem a piece of it in between the new white carving beautiful in the solemn starry nights so solemn that it almost reached agony the awe and joy one had in their great beauty but of all these beautiful times i remember the whole only of autumn tide the others come in bits to me i can think only of parts of them but all of autumn and of all days and nights in autumn i remember one more particularly that autumn day the church was nearly finished and the monks for whom we were building the church and the people who lived in the town hard by crowded round us oftentimes to watch us carving now the great church and the buildings of the abbey where the monks lived were about three miles from the town and the town stood on a hill overlooking the rich autumn country it was girt about with great walls that had overhanging battlements and towers at certain places all along the walls and often we could see from the churchyard or the abbey garden the flash of helmets and spears and the dim shadowy waving of banners as the knights and lords and men-at-arms passed to and fro along the battlements and we could see too in the town the three spires of the three churches and the spire of the cathedral which was the tallest of the three was gilt all over with gold and always at night-time a great lamp shone from it that hung in the spire midway between the roof of the church and the cross at the top of the spire the abbey where we built the church was not girt by stone walls but by a circle of poplar trees and whenever a wind passed over them were it ever so little a breath it set them all a ripple and when the wind was high they bowed and swayed very low and the wind as it lifted the leaves and showed their silvery white sides or as again in the lulls of it it let them drop kept on changing the trees from green to white and white to green moreover through the boughs and trunks of the poplars we caught glimpses of the great golden corn sea waving 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 for leagues and leagues and among the corn grew burning scarlet poppies and blue cornflowers and the cornflowers were so blue that they gleamed and seemed to burn with a steady light as they grew beside the poppies among the gold of the wheat through the corn sea ran a blue river and always green meadows and lines of tall poplars followed its windings the old church had been burned and that was the reason why the monks caused me to build the new one the buildings of the abbey were built at the same time as the burned-down church more than a hundred years before i was born and they were on the north side of the church and joined to it by a cloister of round arches and in the midst of the cloister was a lawn and in the midst of that lawn a fountain of marble carved round about with flowers and strange beasts 
and at the edge of the lawn near the round arches were a great many sunflowers that were all in blossom on that autumn day and up many of the pillars of the cloister crept passion flowers and roses then farther from the church and past the cloister and its buildings were many detached buildings and a great garden round them all within the circle of the poplar trees in the garden were trellises covered over with roses and convolvulus and the great leaved fiery nasturtium and specially all along by the poplar trees were their trellises but on these grew nothing but deep crimson roses the hollyhocks too were all out in blossom at that time great spires of pink and orange and red and white with their soft downy leaves i said that nothing grew on the trellises by the poplars but crimson roses but i was not quite right for in many places the wild flowers had crept into the garden from without lush green bryony with green white blossoms that grows so fast one could almost think that we see it grow and deadly nightshade la bella donna oh so beautiful red berry and purple yellow spikes flower and deadly cruel-looking dark green leaf all growing together in the glorious days of early autumn and in the midst of the great garden was a conduit with its sides carved with histories from the bible and there was on it too as on the fountain in the cloister much carving of flowers and strange beasts now the church itself was surrounded on every side but the north by the cemetery and there were many graves there both of monks and of laymen and often the friends of those whose bodies lay there had planted flowers about the graves of those they loved i remember one such particularly for at the head of it was a cross of carved wood and at the foot of it facing the cross three tall sunflowers then in the midst of the cemetery was a cross of stone carved on one side with the crucifixion of our lord jesus christ and on the other with our lady holding the divine child so that day that i specially remember in autumn tide when the church was nearly finished i was carving in the central porch of the west front for i carved all those bas-reliefs in the west front with my own hand beneath me my sister margaret was carving at the flower-work and the little quatrefoils that carry the signs of the zodiac and emblems of the months now my sister margaret was rather more than twenty years old at that time and she was very beautiful with dark brown hair and deep calm violet eyes i had lived with her all my life lived with her almost alone latterly for our father and mother died when she was quite young and i loved her very much though i was not thinking of her just then as she stood beneath me carving now the central porch was carved with a bas-relief of the last judgment and it was divided into three parts by horizontal bands of deep flower-work in the lowest division just above the doors was carved the rising of the dead above were angels blowing long trumpets and michael the archangel weighing the souls and the blessed led into heaven by angels and the lost into hell by the devil and in the topmost division was the judge of the world all the figures in the porch were finished except one and i remember when i woke that morning my exultation at the thought of my church being so nearly finished i remember too how a kind of misgiving mingled with the exultation which try all i could i was unable to shake off i thought then it was a rebuke for my pride well perhaps it was the figure i had to carve was abraham sitting with a blossoming tree on each side of him holding in his two hands the corners of his great robe so that it made a mighty fold wherein with their hands crossed over their breasts were the souls of the faithful of whom he was called father i stood on the scaffolding for some time while margaret's chisel worked on bravely down below i took mine in my hand and stood so listening to the noise of the masons inside and two monks of the abbey came and stood below me and a knight holding his little daughter by the hand who every now and then looked up at him and asked him strange questions i did not think of these long but began to think of abraham yet i could not think of him sitting there quiet and solemn while the judgment trumpet was being blown i rather thought of him as he looked when he chased those kings so far 
riding far ahead of any of his company with his mailhood off his head and lying in grim folds down his back with the strong west wind blowing his wild black hair far out behind him with the wind rippling the long scarlet pennon of his lance riding there amid the rocks and the sands alone with the last gleam of the armour of the beaten kings disappearing behind the winding of the pass with his company a long long way behind quite out of sight though their trumpets sounded faintly among the clefts of the rocks and so i thought i saw him till in his fierce chase he leapt horse and man into a deep river quiet swift and smooth and there was something in the moving of the water-lilies as the breast of the horse swept them aside that suddenly took away the thought of abraham and brought a strange dream of lands i had never seen and the first was of a place where i was quite alone standing by the side of a river and there was the sound of singing a very long way off but no living thing of any kind could be seen and the land was quite flat quite without hills and quite without trees too and the river wound very much making all kinds of quaint curves and on the side where i stood there grew nothing but long grass but on the other side grew quite on to the horizon a great sea of red corn poppies only paths of white lilies wound all among them with here and there a great golden sunflower so i looked down at the river by my feet and saw how blue it was and how as the stream went swiftly by it swayed to and fro the long green weeds and i stood and looked at the river for long till at last i felt some one touch me on the shoulder and looking round i saw standing by me my friend amiot whom i love better than any one else in the world but i thought in my dream that i was frightened when i saw him for his face had changed so it was so bright and almost transparent and his eyes gleamed and shone as i had never seen them do before oh he was so wondrously beautiful so fearfully beautiful and as i looked at him the distant music swelled and seemed to come close up to me and then swept by us and fainted away at last died off entirely and then i felt sick at heart and faint and parched and i stooped to drink of the water of the river and as soon as the water touched my lips lo the river vanished and the flat country with its poppies and lilies and i dreamed that i was in a boat by myself again floating in an almost landlocked bay of the northern sea under a cliff of dark basalt i was lying on my back in the boat looking up at the intensely blue sky and a long low swell from the outer sea lifted the boat up and let it fall again and carried it gradually nearer and nearer towards the dark cliff and as i moved on i saw at last on the top of the cliff a castle with many towers and on the highest tower of the castle there was a great white banner floating with a red chevron on it and three golden stars on the chevron presently i saw too on one of the towers growing in a cranny of the worn stones a great bunch of golden and blood-red wallflowers and i watched the wallflowers and banner for long when suddenly i heard a trumpet blow from the castle and saw a rush of armed men on to the battlements and there was a fierce fight till at last it was ended and one went to the banner and pulled it down and cast it over the cliff into the sea and it came down in long sweeps with the wind making little ripples in it slowly slowly it came till at last it fell over me and covered me from my feet till over my breast and i let it stay there and looked again at the castle and then i saw that there was an amber colour banner floating over the castle in the place of the red chevron and it was much larger than the other also now a man stood on the battlements looking towards me he had a tilting helmet on with the visor down and an amber-coloured surcoat over his armour his right hand was ungauntleted and he held it high above his head and in his hand was the bunch of wallflowers that i had seen growing on the wall and his hand was white and small like a woman's for in my dream i could see even very far-off things much clearer than we see real material things on the earth presently he threw the wallflowers over the cliff and they fell into the boat 
just behind my head and then i saw looking down from the battlements of the castle amiot he looked down towards me very sorrowfully i thought but even as in the other dream said nothing so i thought in my dream that i wept for very pity and for love of him for he looked as a man just risen from a long illness and who will carry till he dies a dull pain about with him he was very thin and his long black hair drooped all about his face as he leaned over the battlements looking at me he was quite pale and his cheeks were hollow but his eyes large and soft and sad so i reached out my arms to him and suddenly i was walking with him in a lovely garden and we said nothing for the music which i had heard at first was sounding close to us now and there were many birds in the boughs of the trees oh such birds gold and ruby and emerald but they sung not at all but were quite silent as though they too were listening to the music now all this time amiot and i had been looking at each other but just then i turned my head away from him and as soon as i did so the music ended with a long wail and when i turned again amiot was gone then i felt even more sad and sick at heart than i had before when i was by the river and i leaned against a tree and put my hands before my eyes when i looked again the garden was gone and i knew not where i was and presently all my dreams were gone the chips were flying bravely from the stone under my chisel at last and all my thoughts were now in my carving when i heard my name walter called and when i looked down i saw one standing below me whom i had seen in my dreams just before amiot i had no hopes of seeing him for a long time perhaps i might never see him again i thought for he was away as i thought fighting in the holy wars and it made me almost beside myself to see him standing close by me in the flesh i got down from my scaffolding as soon as i could and all thoughts else were soon drowned in the joy of having him by me margaret too how glad she must have been for she had been betrothed to him for some time before he went to the wars and he had been five years away five years and how we had thought of him through those many weary days how often his face had come before me his brave honest face the most beautiful among all the faces of men and women i have ever seen yes i remember how five years ago i held his hand as we came together out of the cathedral of that great far-off city whose name i forget now and then i remember the stamping of the horse's feet i remember how his hand left mine at last and then some one looking back at me earnestly as they all rode on together looking back with his hand on the saddle behind him while the trumpets sang in long solemn peals as they all rode on together with the glimmer of arms and the fluttering of banners and the clinking of the rings of the mail that sounded like the falling of many drops of water into the deep still waters of some pool that the rocks nearly meet over and the gleam and flash of the swords and the glimmer of the lance-heads and the flutter of the rippled banners that streamed out from them swept past me and were gone and they seemed like a pageant in a dream whose meaning we know not and those sounds too the trumpets and the clink of the mail and the thunder of the horse-hoofs they seemed dream-like too and it was all like a dream that he should leave me for we had said that we should always be together but he went away and now he has come back again we were by his bedside margaret and i i stood and leaned over him and my hair fell sideways over my face and touched his face margaret kneeled beside me quivering in every limb not with pain i think but rather shaken by a passion of earnest prayer after some time i know not how long i looked up from his face to the window underneath which he lay i do not know what time of day it was but i know that it was a glorious autumn day a day soft with melting golden haze a vine and a rose grew together and trailed half across the window so that i could not see much of the beautiful blue sky and nothing of town or country beyond the vine leaves were touched with red here and there and three overblown roses light pink roses hung amongst them 
i remember dwelling on the strange lines the autumn had made in red on one of the gold-green vine leaves and watching one leaf of one of the overblown roses expecting it to fall every minute but as i gazed and felt disappointed that the rose-leaf had not fallen yet i felt my pain suddenly shoot through me and i remembered what i had lost and then came bitter bitter dreams dreams which had once made me happy dreams of the things i had hoped would be of the things that would never be now they came between the fair fine leaves and rose blossoms and that which lay before the window they came as before perfect in colour and form sweet sounds and shapes but now in every one was something unutterably miserable they would not go away they put out the steady glow of the golden haze the sweet light of the sun through the vine leaves the soft leaning of the full-blown roses i wandered in them for a long time at last i felt a hand put me aside gently for i was standing at the head of of the bed then some one kissed my forehead and words were spoken i know not what words the bitter dreams left me for the bitterer reality at last for i had found him that morning lying dead only the morning after i had seen him when he had come back from his long absence i had found him lying dead with his hands crossed downwards with his eyes closed as though the angels had done that for him and now when i looked at him he still lay there and margaret knelt by him with her face touching his she was not quivering now her lips moved not at all as they had done just before and so suddenly those words came to my mind which she had spoken when she kissed me and which at the time i had only heard with my outward hearing for she had said walter farewell and christ keep you but for me i must be with him for so i promised him last night that i would never leave him any more and god will let me go and verily margaret and amiot did go and left me very lonely and sad it was just beneath the westernmost arch of the nave there i carved their tomb i was a long time carving it i did not think i should be so long at first and i said i shall die when i have finished carving it thinking that would be a very short time but so it happened after i had carved those two whom i loved lying with clasped hands like husband and wife above their tomb that i could not yet leave carving it and so that i might be near them i became a monk and used to sit in the choir and sing thinking of the time when we should all be together again and as i had time i used to go to the westernmost arch of the nave and work at the tomb that was there under the great sweeping arch and in process of time i raised a marble canopy that reached quite up to the top of the arch and i painted it too as fair as i could and carved it all about with many flowers and histories and in them i carved the faces of those i had known on earth for i was not as one on earth now but seemed quite a way out of the world and as i carved sometimes the monks and other people too would come and gaze and watch how the flowers grew and sometimes too as they gazed they would weep for pity knowing how all had been so my life passed and i lived in that abbey for twenty years after he died till one morning quite early when they came into the church for matins they found me lying dead with my chisel in my hand underneath the last lily of the tomb end of the story of the unknown church end of part one part two of prose romances from the oxford and cambridge magazine by william morris this librivox recording is in the public domain a dream oxford and cambridge magazine march eighteen fifty six i dreamed once that four men sat by the winter fire talking and telling tales in a house that the wind howled round and one of them the eldest said when i was a boy before you came to this land 
that bar of red sand rock which makes a fall in our river had only just been formed for it used to stand above the river in a great cliff tunnelled by a cave about midway between the green growing grass and the green flowing river and it fell one night when you had not yet come to this land no nor your fathers now concerning this cliff or pike rather for it was a tall slip of rock and not part of a range many strange tales were told and my father used to say that in his time many would have explored that cave either from covetousness expecting to find gold therein or from that love of wonders which most young men have but fear kept them back within the memory of man however some had entered and so men said were never seen on earth again but my father said that the tales told concerning such very far from deterring him then quite a youth from the quest of this cavern made him all the more earnestly long to go so that one day in his fear my grandfather to prevent him stabbed him in the shoulder so that he was obliged to keep his bed for long and somehow he never went and died at last without ever having seen the inside of the cavern my father told me many wondrous tales about the place whereof for a long time i have been able to remember nothing yet by some means or another a certain story has grown up in my heart which i will tell you something of a story which no living creature ever told me though i do not remember the time when i knew it not yes i will tell you some of it not all of it perhaps but as much as i am allowed to tell the man stopped and pondered a while leaning over the fire where the flames slept under the caked coal he was an old man and his hair was quite white he spoke again presently and i have fancied sometimes that in some way how i know not i am mixed up with the strange story i am going to tell you again he ceased and gazed at the fire bending his head down till his beard touched his knees then rousing himself said in a changed voice for he had been speaking dreamily hitherto that strange-looking old house that you all know with the limes and yew trees before it and the double line of very old yew trees leading up from the gateway tower to the porch you know how no one will live there now because it is so eerie and how even that bold bad lord that would come there with his turbulent followers was driven out in shame and disgrace by invisible agency well in times past there dwelt in that house an old grey man who was lord of that estate his only daughter and a young man a kind of distant cousin of the house whom the lord had brought up from a boy as he was quite the orphan of a kinsman who had fallen in combat in his quarrel now as the young knight and the young lady were both beautiful and brave and loved beauty and good things ardently it was natural enough that they should discover as they grew up that they were in love with one another and afterwards as they went on loving one another it was alas not unnatural that they should sometimes have half quarrels very few and far between indeed and slight to lookers on even while they lasted but nevertheless intensely bitter and unhappy to the principal parties thereto i suppose their love then whatever it has grown to since was not so all-absorbing as to merge all differences of opinion and feeling for again there were such differences then so upon a time it happened just when a great war had arisen and lawrence for that was the knight's name was sitting and thinking of war and his departure from home sitting there in a very grave almost a stern mood that ella his betrothed came in gay and sprightly in a humour that lawrence often enough could little understand and this time liked less than ever yet the bare sight of her made him yearn for her full heart which he was not to have yet so he caught her by the hand and tried to draw her down to him but she let her hand lie loose in his and did not answer the pressure in which his heart flowed to hers then he arose and stood before her face to face but she drew back a little yet he kissed her on the mouth and said though a rising in his throat almost choked his voice ella are you sorry that i am going yea she said 
and nay for you will shout my name among the sword flashes and you will fight for me yes he said for love and duty dearest for duty ah ah i think lawrence if it were not for me you would stay at home and watch the clouds or sit under the linden trees singing dismal love ditties of your own making dear knight truly if you turn out a great warrior i too shall live in fame for i am certainly the making of your desire to fight he let drop his hands from her shoulders where he had laid them and said with a faint flush over his face you wrong me ella for though i have never wished to fight for the mere love of fighting and though and here again he flushed a little and though i am not i well know so free of the fear of death as a good man would be yet for this duty's sake which is really a higher love ella love of god i trust i would risk life nay honour even if not willingly yet cheerfully at least still duty duty she said you lay lawrence as many people do most stress on the point where you are weakest moreover those knights who in times past have done wild mad things merely at their lady's word scarcely did so for duty for they owed their lives to their country surely to the cause of good and should not have risked them for a whim and yet you praised them the other day did i said lawrence well and in a way they were much to be praised for even blind love and obedience is well but reasonable love reasonable obedience is so far better as to be almost a different thing yet i think if the knights did well partly the ladies did altogether ill for if they had faith in their lovers and did this merely from a mad longing to see them do noble deeds then had they but little faith in god who can and at his good pleasure does give time and opportunity to every man if he will but watch for it to serve him with reasonable service and gain love and all noble things in greater measure thereby but if these ladies did as they did that they might prove their knights then surely did they lack faith both in god and man i do not think that two friends even could live together on such terms but for lovers ah ella ella why do you look so at me on this day almost the last we shall be together for long ella your face is changed your eyes oh christ help her and me help her good lord lawrence she said speaking quickly and in jerks dare you for my sake sleep this night in the cavern of the red pike for i say to you that faithful or not i doubt your courage but she was startled when she saw him and how the fiery blood rushed up to his forehead then sank to his heart again and his face became as pale as the face of a dead man he looked at her and said yes ella i will go now for what matter where i go he turned and moved toward the door he was almost gone when that evil spirit left her and she cried out aloud passionately eagerly lawrence lawrence come back once more if only to strike me dead with your knightly sword he hesitated wavered turned and in another moment she was lying in his arms weeping into his hair and yet ella the spoken word the thought of our hearts cannot be recalled i must go and go this night too only promise one thing dearest what you are always right love you must promise that if i come not again by to-morrow at moonrise you will go to the red pike and having entered the cavern go where god leads you and seek me and never leave that quest even if it end not but with death lawrence how your heart beats poor heart are you afraid that i shall hesitate to promise to perform that which is the only thing i could do i know i am not worthy to be with you yet i must be with you in body or soul or body and soul will die they sat silent and the birds sang in the garden of lilies beyond then said ella again moreover let us pray to god to give us longer life so that if our natural lives are short for the accomplishment of this quest we may have more yea even many more lives he will my ella said lawrence and i think nay i am sure that our wish will be granted and i too will add a prayer but will ask it very humbly namely that he will give me another chance or more to fight in his cause 
another life to live instead of this failure let us pray too that we may meet however long the time be before our meeting she said so they knelt down and prayed hand fast locked in hand meantime and afterwards they sat in that chamber facing the east hard by the garden of lilies and the sun fell from his noontide light gradually lengthening the shadows and when he sank below the skyline all the sky was faint tender crimson on a ground of blue the crimson faded too and the moon began to rise but when her golden rim first showed over the wooded hills lawrence arose they kissed one long trembling kiss and then he went and armed himself and their lips did not meet again after that for such a long long time so many weary years for he had said ella watch me from the porch but touch me not again at this time only when the moon shows level with the lily heads go into the porch and watch me from thence and he was gone you might have heard her heart beating while the moon very slowly rose till it shone through the rose-covered trellises level with the lily heads then she went to the porch and stood there and she saw him walking down toward the gateway tower clad in his mail coat with a bright crestless helmet on his head and his trenchant sword newly grinded girt to his side and she watched him going between the yew-trees which began to throw shadows from the shining of the harvest moon she stood there in the porch and round by the corners of the eaves of it looked down towards her and the inside of the porch two serpent dragons carved in stone and on their scales and about their leering eyes grew the yellow lichen she shuddered as she saw them stare at her and drew closer toward the half-open door she standing there clothed in white from her throat till over her feet altogether ungirdled and her long yellow hair without plait or band fell down behind and lay along her shoulders quietly because the night was without wind and she too was now standing scarcely moving a muscle she gazed down the line of the yew trees and watched how as he went for the most part with a firm step he yet shrank somewhat from the shadows of the yews his long brown hair flowing downward swayed with him as he walked and the golden threads interwoven with it as the fashion was with the warriors in those days sparkled out from among it now and then and the faint far-off moonlight lit up the waves of his mail coat he walked fast and was disappearing in the shadows of the trees near the moat but turned before he was quite lost in them and waved his ungauntleted hand then she heard the challenge of the warder the falling of the drawbridge the swing of the heavy wicket-gate on its hinges and into the brightening lights and deepening shadows of the moonlight he went from her sight and she left the porch and went to the chapel all that night praying earnestly there but he came not back again all the next day and ella wandered about that house pale and fretting her heart away so when night came and the moon she arrayed herself in that same raiment that she had worn on the night before and went toward the river and the red pike the broad moon shone right over it by the time she came to the river the pike rose up from the other side and she thought at first that she would have to go back again cross over the bridge and so get to it but glancing down on the river just as she turned she saw a little boat fairly gilt and painted and with a long slender paddle in it lying on the water stretching out its silken painter as the stream drew it downwards she entered it and taking the paddle made for the other side the moon meanwhile turning the eddies to silver over the dark green water she landed beneath the shadow of that great pile of sandstone where the grass grew green and the flowers sprung fair right up to the foot of the bare barren rock it was cut in many steps till it reached the cave which was overhung by creepers and matted grass 
the stream swept the boat downwards and ella her heart beating so as almost to stop her breath mounted the steps slowly slowly she reached at last the platform below the cave and turning gave a long gaze at the moonlit country her last she said then she moved and the cave hid her as the water of the warm seas close over the pearl diver just so in the night before had it hidden lawrence and they never came back they too never the people say i wonder what their love has grown to now ah they love i know but cannot find each other yet i wonder if they ever will so spoke hugh the white-haired but he who sat over against him a soldier as it seemed black-bearded with wild grey eyes that his great brows hung over far he while the others sat still awed by some vague sense of spirits being very near them this man giles cried out never old hugh it is not so speak i cannot tell you how it happened but i know it was not so not so speak quick hugh tell us all all wait a little my son wait said hugh the people indeed said they never came back again at all but i ah the time is long past over so he was silent and sank his head on his breast though his old thin lips moved as if he talked softly to himself and the light of past days flickered in his eyes meanwhile giles sat with his hands clasped finger over finger tightly till the knuckles whitened his lips were pressed firmly together his breast heaved as though it would burst as though it must be rid of its secret suddenly he sprang up and in a voice that was a solemn chant began in full daylight long ago on a slumberously wrathful thunderous afternoon of summer then across his chant ran the old man's shrill voice on an october day packed close with heavy lying mist which was more than mere autumn mist the solemn stately chanting dropped the shrill voice went on giles sank down again and hugh standing there swaying to and fro to the measuring ringing of his own shrill voice his long beard moving with him said on such a day warm and stifling so that no one could scarcely breathe even down by the seashore i went from bed to bed in the hospital of the pest-laden city with my soothing draughts and medicines and there went with me a holy woman her face pale with much watching yet i think even without those same desolate lonely watchings her face would still have been pale she was not beautiful her face being somewhat peevish looking apt she seemed to be made angry by trifles and even on her errand of mercy she spoke roughly to those she tended no she was not beautiful yet i could not help gazing at her for her eyes were very beautiful and looked out from her ugly face as a fair maiden might look from a grim prison between the window bars of it so going through that hospital i came to a bed at last whereon lay one who had not been struck down by fever or plague but had been smitten through the body with a sword by certain robbers so that he had narrowly escaped death huge of frame with stern suffering face he lay there and i came to him and asked him of his hurt and how he fared while the day grew slowly toward even in that pest-chamber looking toward the west the sister came to him soon and knelt down by his bedside to tend him o oh christ as the sun went down on that dim misty day the clouds and the thickly packed mist cleared off to let him shine on us on that chamber of woes and bitter and purifying tears and the sunlight wrapped those two the sick man and the ministering woman shone on them changed changed utterly good lord how was i struck dumb nay almost blinded by that change for there yes there while no man but i wondered there instead of the unloving nurse knelt a wonderfully beautiful maiden clothed all in white and with long golden hair down her back tenderly she gazed at the wounded man as her hands were put about his head lifting it up from the pillow but a very little 
and he no longer the grim strong wounded man but fair and in the first bloom of youth a bright polished helmet crowned his head a mail coat flowed over his breast and his hair streamed down long from his head while from among it here and there shone out threads of gold so they spake thus in a quiet tone body and soul together again ella love how long will it be now before the last time of all long she said but the years pass talk no more dearest but let us think only for the time is short and our bodies can call up memories change love to better even than it was in the old time silence so while you might count a hundred then with a great sigh farewell ella for long farewell lawrence and the sun sank and all was as before but i stood at the foot of the bed pondering till the sister coming to me said master physician this is no time for dreaming act the patients are waiting the fell sickness grows worse in this hot close air feel and she swung open the casement the outer air is no fresher than the air inside the wind blows dead toward the west coming from the stagnant marshes the sea is like a stagnant pool too you can scarce hear the sound of the long low surge breaking i turned from her and went up to the sick man and said sir knight in spite of all the sickness about you you yourself better strangely and another month will see you with your sword girt to your side again thanks kind master hugh he said but impatiently as if his mind were on other things and he turned in his bed away from me restlessly until late that night i ministered to the sick in that hospital but when i went away i walked down to the sea and paced there to and fro over the hard sand and the moon showed bloody with the hot mist which the sea would not take on its bosom though the dull east wind blew it onward continually i walked there pondering till a noise from over the sea made me turn and look that way what was that coming over the sea laus deo the west wind hurrah i feel the joy i felt then over again now in all its intensity how came it over the sea first far out to sea so that it was only just visible under the red gleaming moonlight far out to sea while the mists above grew troubled and wavered a long bar of white it grew nearer quickly it rushed on toward me fearfully fast it gathered form strange misty intricate form the ravelled foam of the green sea then oh hurrah i was wrapped in it the cold salt spray drenched with it blinded by it and when i could see again i saw the great green waves rising nodding and breaking all coming on together and over them from wave to wave leapt the joyous west wind and the mist and the play clouds were sweeping back eastward in wild swirls and right away were they swept at last till they brooded over the face of the dismal stagnant meres many miles away from our fair city and there they pondered wrathfully on their defeat but somehow my life changed from the time when i beheld the two lovers and i grew old quickly he ceased then after a short silence said again and that was long ago very long ago i know not when it happened so he sank back again and for a while no one spoke till giles said at last once in full daylight i saw a vision while i was walking while the eyes of men were upon me long ago on the afternoon of a thunderous summer day i sat alone in my fair garden near the city for on that day a mighty reward was to be given to the brave man who had saved us all leading us so mightily in that battle a few days back now the very queen the lady of the land whom all men reverenced almost as the virgin mother so kind and good and beautiful she was was to crown him with flowers and gird a sword about him 
after the te deum had been sung for the victory and almost all the city were at that time either in the church or hard by it or else were by the hill that was near the river where the crowning was to be but i sat alone in the garden of my house as i said sat grieving for the loss of my brave brother who was slain by my side in that same fight i sat beneath an elm tree and as i sat and pondered on that still windless day i heard suddenly a breath of air rustle through the boughs of the elm i looked up and my heart almost stopped beating i knew not why as i watched the path of that breeze over the bowing lilies and the rushes by the fountain but when i looked to the place whence the breeze had come i became all at once aware of an appearance that told me why my heart stopped beating ah there they were those two whom before i had but seen in dreams by night now before my waking eyes in broad daylight one a knight for so he seemed with long hair mingled with golden threads flowing over his mail coat and a bright crestless helmet on his head his face sad-looking but calm and by his side but not touching him walked a wondrously fair maiden clad in white her eyelids just shadowing her blue eyes her arms and hands seeming to float along with her as she moved on quickly yet very softly great rest on them both though sorrow gleamed through it when they came opposite to where i stood these two stopped for a while being in no wise shadowy as i have heard men say go sar but clear and distinct they stopped close by me as i stood motionless unable to pray they turned to each other face to face and the maiden said love for this last true meeting before the end of all we need a witness let this man softened by sorrow even as we are go with us i never heard such music as her words were though i used to wonder when i was young whether the angels in heaven sung better than the choristers sang in our church and though even then the sound of the triumphant hymn came up to me in a breath of wind and floated round me making dreams in that moment of awe and great dread of the long past days in that old church of her who lay under the pavement of it whose sweet voice once once long ago once only to me yet i shall see her again he became silent as he said this and no man cared to break in upon his thoughts seeing the choking movement in his throat the fierce clenching of hand and foot the stiffening of the muscles all over him but soon with an upward jerk of his head he threw back the long elf locks that had fallen over his eyes while his head was bent down and went on as before the knight passed his hand across his brow as if to clear away some mist that had gathered there and said in a deep murmurous voice why the last time dearest why the last time know you not how long a time remains yet the old man came last night to the ivory house and told me it would be a hundred years ay more before the happy end so long she said so long ah love what things words are yet this is the last time alas alas for the weary years my words my sin oh love it is very terrible he said i could almost weep old though i am and grown cold with dwelling in the ivory house oh ella if you only knew how cold it is there in the starry nights when the north wind is stirring and there is no fair colour there naught but the white ivory with one narrow line of gleaming gold over every window and a fathom's breadth of burnished gold behind the throne ella it was scarce well done of you to send me to the ivory house is it so cold love she said i knew it's not forgive me but as to the matter of a witness some one we must have and why not this man rather old hugh he said or cuthbert his father they have both been witnesses before cuthbert said the maiden solemnly has been dead twenty years hugh died last night now as giles said these words carelessly as though not heeding them particularly a cold sickening shudder ran through the other two men but he noted it not and went on this man then be it said the knight and therewith they turned again and moved on side by side as before 
nor said they any word to me and yet i could not help following them and we three moved on together and soon i saw that my nature was changed and that i was invisible for the time for though the sun was high i cast no shadow neither did any man that we passed notice us as we made toward the hill by the river-side and by the time we came there the queen was sitting at the top of it under a throne of purple and gold with a great band of knights gloriously armed on either side of her and their many banners floated over them then i felt that those two had left me and that my own right visible nature was returned yet still did i feel strange and as if i belong not wholly to this earth and i heard one say in a low voice to his fellow see sir giles is here after all yet how came he here and why is he not in armour among the noble knights yonder he who fought so well how wild he looks too poor knight said the other he is distraught with the loss of his brother let him be and see here comes the noble stranger knight our deliverer as he spoke we heard a great sound of trumpets and therewithal a long line of knights on foot wound up the hill towards the throne and the queen rose up and the people shouted and at the end of all the procession went slowly and majestically the stranger knight a man of noble presence he was calm and graceful to look on grandly he went amid the gleaming of their golden armour himself clad in the rent mail and tattered surcoat he had worn on that battle day bareheaded too for in that fierce fight in the thickest of it just where he rallied our men one smote off his helmet and another coming from behind would have slayed him but that my lance bit into his breast so when they had come within some twenty paces of the throne the rest halted and he went up by himself toward the queen and she taking the golden-hilted sword in her left hand with her right hand caught him by the wrist when he would have knelt to her and held him so tremblingly and cried out no no thou noblest of all knights kneel not to me have we not heard of thee even before thou camest hither how many widows bless thee how many orphans pray for thee how many happy ones that would be widows and orphans but for thee sing to their children sing to their sisters of thy flashing sword and the heart that guides it and now o noble one thou hast done the very noblest deed of all for thou hast kept grown men from weeping shameful tears o oh, truly the greatest i can do for thee is very little yet see this sword golden hilted and the stones flash out from it then she hung it round him and see this wreath of lilies and roses for thy head lilies no whiter than thy pure heart roses no tenderer than thy true love and here before all these my subjects i fold thee noblest in my arms so so ay truly it was strange enough those two were together again not the queen and the stranger knight but the young seeming knight and the maiden i had seen in the garden to my eyes they clung together there though they say that to the eyes of all else it was but for a moment that the queen held both his hands in hers to me also amid the shouting of the multitude came an undercurrent of happy song oh truly very truly my noblest a hundred years will not be long after this hush ella dearest for talking makes the time speed think only pressed close to each other as i saw it their bosoms heaved but i looked away alas when i looked again i saw nothing but the stately stranger knight descending hand in hand with the queen flushed with joy and triumph and the people scattering flowers before them and that was long ago very long ago so he ceased then osric one of the two younger men who had been sitting in awestruck silence all this time said with eyes that dared not meet giles in a terrified half whisper as though he meant not to speak how long giles turned round and looked him full in the face till he dragged his eyes up to his own then said more than a hundred years ago so they all sat silent listening to the roar of the south-west wind and it blew the window so 
that they rocked in their frames then suddenly as they sat thus came a knock at the door of the house so hugh bowed his head to osric to signify that he should go and open the door so he arose trembling and went and as he opened the door the wind blew hard against him and blew something white against his face then blew it away again and his face was blanched even to his lips but he plucking up heart of grace looked out and there he saw standing with her face upturned in speech to him a wonderfully beautiful woman clothed from her throat till over her feet in long white raiment ungirt unbroidered and with a long veil that was thrown off from her face and hung from her head streaming out in the blast of the wind which veil was what had struck against his face beneath her veil her golden hair streamed out too and with the veil so that it touched his face now and then she was very fair but she did not look young either because of her statue-like features she spoke to him slowly and queenly i pray you give me shelter in your house for an hour that i may rest and so go on my journey again he was too much terrified to answer in words and so only bowed his head and she swept past him in stately wise to the room where the others sat and he followed her trembling a cold shiver ran through the other men when she entered and bowed low to them and they turned deadly pale but dared not move and there she sat while they gazed at her sitting there and wondering at her beauty which seemed to grow every minute though she was plainly not young oh no but rather very very old who could say how old there she sat and her long long hair swept down in one curve from her head and just touched the floor her face had the tokens of a deep sorrow on it ah a mighty sorrow yet not so mighty as that it might mar her ineffable loveliness that sorrow mark seemed to gather too and at last the gloriously slow music of her words flowed from her lips friends has one with the appearance of a youth come here lately one with long brown hair interwoven with threads of gold flowing down from out of his polished steel helmet with dark blue eyes and high white forehead and a mail coat over his breast where the light and shadow lie in waves as he moves have you seen such an one very beautiful then with all as they shook their heads fearfully in answer a great sigh rose up from her heart and she said then i must go away again presently and yet i thought it was the last night of all and so she sat a while with her head resting on her hand after she arose as if about to go and turned her glorious head round to thank the master of the house and they strangely enough though they were terrified at her presence were yet grieved when they saw that she was going just then the wind rose higher than ever before yet through the roar of it they could all hear plainly a knocking at the door again so the lady stopped when she heard it and turning looked full in the face of Herman the youngest, who thereupon, being constrained by that look, rose and went to the door, and as before with Osric, so now the wind blew strong against him, and it blew into his face so as to blind him, tresses of soft brown hair mingled with glittering threads of gold. And blinded so, he heard someone ask him musically, solemnly, if a lady with golden hair and white raiment was in that house so herman not answering in words because of his awe and fear merely bowed his head then he was ware of some one in bright armour passing him for the gleam of it was all about him for as yet he could not see clearly being blinded by the hair that had floated about him but presently he followed him into the room and there stood such an one as the lady had described the wavering flame of the light gleamed from his polished helmet touched the golden threads that mingled with his hair ran along the rings of his mail 
they stood opposite to each other for a little he and the lady as if they were somewhat shy of each other after their parting of a hundred years in spite of the love which they had for each other at last he made one step and took off his gleaming helmet laid it down softly then spread abroad his arms and she came to him and they were clasped together her head lying over his shoulder and the four men gazed quite awestruck and as they gazed the bells of the church began to ring for it was new year's eve and still they clung together and the bells rang on and the old year died and there beneath the eyes of those four men the lovers slowly faded away into a heap of snow-white ashes then the four men kneeled down and prayed and the next day they went to the priest and told him all that had happened so the people took those ashes and buried them in their church in a marble tomb and above it they caused to be carved their figures lying with clasped hands and on the sides of it the history of the cave in the red pike and in my dream i saw the moon shining on the tomb throwing fair colours on it from the painted glass till a sound of music rose deepened and fainted then i woke no memory labours longer from the deep gold mines of thought to lift the hidden ore that glimpses moving up than i from sleep to gather and tell all each little sound and sight End of a Dream by William Morris End of Part 2Part three of Prose Romances from the Oxford and Cambridge magazine by William Morris. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Frank's sealed letter, Oxford and Cambridge magazine, April eighteen fifty six. Ever since I can remember, even when I was quite a child, people have always told me that I had no perseverance, no strength of will they have always kept on saying to me directly and indirectly unstable as water thou shalt not excel and they have always been quite wrong in this matter for of all men i ever heard of i have the strongest will for good and evil i could soon find out whether a thing were possible or not to me then if it were not i threw it away for ever never thought of it again no regret no longing for that it was past and over to me but if it were possible and i made up my mind to do it then and there i began it and in due time finished it turning neither to the right hand nor the left till it was done so i did with all things that i set my hand to love only and the wild restless passions that went with it were too strong for me and they bent my strong will so that people think me now a weak man with no end to make for in the purposeless wanderings of my life yes my life is purposeless now i have failed i know but i know that i have fought too i know the weary struggle from day to day in which with my loins girded and my muscles all astrain i have fought while years and years have passed away i know what they do not how that passion trembled in my grasp shook staggered how i grew stronger and stronger till when as i stood at last quivering with collected force the light of victory across my lips and brow god's hands struck me and i fell at once and without remedy and am now a vanquished man and really without any object in life not desiring death any more than life or life any more than death a vanquished man though no coward forlorn hopeless unloved living now altogether in the past i will tell you how i fell and then i pray you all to pity me and if you can love me and pray for me that i may be forgiven i said when i left her that day that i would forget her look upon her as if she had never been coming and going to and from that house indeed seeing her often talking to her as to any other friendly and accomplished lady 
but seeing mabel my mabel that had been no more she was dead and the twenty years that i had lived with her man and boy and little child were gone dead too and forgotten no shadow of them should rest upon my path i said meantime the world wanted help i was strong and willing and would help it i saw all about me men without a leader looking and yearning for one to come and help them i would be that leader i said there was no reason for me to be bitter and misanthropical for i could forget the past utterly could be another man in short why i never loved that woman there with her heavy sweeping black hair and dreamy passionate eyes that was someone passed away long ago who knows when he lived but i am the man that knows that feels all poetry and art that can create that can sympathise with every man and woman that ever lived even with that cold proud woman there without a heart but with heavy sweeping hair and great dreamily passionate eyes which might cause a weak man to love her yes i said so when i left her nay even before i left her for in my agonised pleading i had said words that had made her cold selfish blood run quick enough to speak scornful things to me mabel i said mabel think a while before you turn from me for ever am i not good enough for you yet tell me i pray you for god's sake what would you have me do what would you have me make myself and i will do that thing make myself such whatever it is think how long i have worshipped you looked on all the world through your eyes i loved you as soon as i saw you even when i was a child before i had reason almost and my love and my reason have grown together till now oh mabel think of the things we have talked of together thought of together will you ever find another man who thinks the same as you do in everything nay but you must love me such letters you have written me too oh mabel mabel i know god will never let love like mine go unrequited you love me i know i am sure of it you are trying me only let it be enough now my own mabel the only one that loves me see do not i love you enough i fell there before her feet i caught the hem of her garment i buried my face in its folds madly i strove to convince myself that she was but trying me that she could not speak for her deep love that it was a dream only oh how i tried to wake to find myself with my heart beating wildly and the black night round me lying on my bed as often when a child i used to wake from a dream of lions and robbers and ugly deaths and the devil to find myself in the dear room though it was dark my heart bounding with the fear of pursuit and joy of escape but no dream breaks now desperate desperate earnest the dreams have closed round me and become the dismalest reality as i often used to fear those other dreams might the walls of this fact are closed round about me now like the sides of an iron chest hurrying on down some swift river with the black water above to the measureless rolling sea i shall never any more wake to anything but that for listen to what she said you who are happy lovers can you believe it i can scarce do so myself i not looking up from where i lay felt her lips curl into a cruel smile as she drew herself from my grasp and said listen hugh i call you hugh by the way not because i am fond of you but because surnames never seem to me to express anything they are quite meaningless hugh i never loved you never shall nay something more i am not quite sure that i do not hate you for coming to claim me as a right in this way and appealing to god against me who gave you any right to be lord over me and question my heart why for this long time i have seen that you would claim me at last and your love which i now cast from me for ever and trample upon so so your love i say has been a bitterly heavy burden to me dogging me up and down everywhere you think my thoughts yes verily you who think yourself the teacher of such an one as i am 
have few thoughts of your own to think what do i want better than you why i want a man who is brave and beautiful you are a coward and a cripple am i trying you no hugh there is no need for that i think i know you well enough weak and irresolute you will never do anything great i must marry a great man white honour shall be like a plaything to him borne lightly a pet falcon on his wrist one who can feel the very pulse of the time instant to act to plunge into the strife and with a strong arm hold the rearing world but before she had begun to quote my life had changed while i lay there in i know not what agony that which i have just said came suddenly across me i became calm all at once i began to bend my passion beneath my strong will the fight i fought so bravely had begun i rose up quietly before she began to quote and when she saw me standing there so calmly i and looking so brave too though i was a cripple and a coward she quailed before me her voice fell even in the midst of her scornful speech then i thought so cool and can quote pretty verses at such a time oh but my revenge is good and sure too it is almost as if i killed her stabbed her to the heart here in this room then my heart grew quite obedient and my purpose began to work so that i could speak with no shadow of passion in my words and with no forced unnatural calm either i could seem and for years and years did seem to be no hard cold man of the world no mere calculating machine for gauging god's earth by modern science but a kindly genial man though so full of knowledge yet having room for love too and enthusiasm and faith ah they who saw me as such did not see the fight did not see that bitter passage in the room of the old house at riston where the river widens i stood there silent for a very short time then raising my eyes to hers said well mabel i shall go up to london and see the publishers and perhaps stay there a day or two so that i shall probably be back again at Kaysley by tuesday and i dare say i shall find time to walk over to riston on wednesday or thursday to tell you what we have determined on good-bye she trembled and turned pale as i gave her my hand and said good-bye in a forced tone that was in strong contrast to my natural seeming calmness she was frightened of me then already good so i walked away from riston to my own house at Kaysley, which was about two miles from riston and got ready to start for london then about an hour after i had parted from her set out again across the fields to the railway that was five miles from my house it was on the afternoon of a lovely spring day i took a book with me a volume of poems just published and my dead friend's manuscript for my purpose in going to london was to see to its publication then looking at that over which so many years of toil and agony of striving had been spent i thought of him who wrote it thought how admirable he was how that glorious calm purpose of his shot through all his restless energy i thought too as i had never done before of the many many ways he had helped me and my eyes filled with tears as i remembered remorsefully the slight return i had given him for his affection my forgetfulness of him in the years when i was happy i thought of his quiet successful love and that sweet wife of his the poor widow that was now who lived at florence watching the shadows come and go on her husband's tomb the rain that washed it the sun and moon that shone on it then how he had died at florence and of the short letter he had written to me or rather that had been written just before his death by his wife from his dictation and stained with the many tears of the poor heart-broken lady those farewell words that threw but a slight shadow over the happy days when i loved mabel had more weight now both for the sorrow and consolation for the thought that the dead man cared for me surely did me good made me think more of the unseen world less of the terrible earth-world that seemed all going wrong 
and which the unseen was slowly writing i had the letter with me at that very time i had taken it out with the manuscript and together with that another a sealed letter that came with it and which according to the dying man's wish i had never yet opened i took out both the letters and turning aside from the path sat down under a willow by the side of the river a willow just growing grey-green with the spring and there to the music of the west wind through the slim boughs to the very faint music of the river's flow i read the two letters and the first one i had read before dear friend i am going the last journey and i wish to say farewell before i go my wife's tears fall fast as she writes and i am sorry to go though i think not afraid to die two things i want to say to you the first and least has to do with my writings i do not wish them to perish you know i wrote thinking i might do some one good will you see about this for me do you know hugh i never cared for any man so much as for you there was something which drew me to you wonderfully it used to trouble me sometimes to think that you scarcely cared for me so much but only sometimes for i saw that you knew this and tried to love me more it was not your fault that you could not god bless you for the trying even when you see my wife be kind to her we have had happy talk about you often thinking what a great man you ought to be yet one thing more i send you with this a sealed enclosure on the day that you are married to mabel or on the day that she dies still loving you burn this unopened but o oh friend if such a misfortune happen to you as i scarce dare hint at even then open it and read it for the sake of frank then i remembered sadly how when i read this i was angry at first even with the dead man for his suspicion only when i thought of him dying and how loving he was my anger quickly sunk into regret for him not deep anguish but quiet regret ah what a long time it was since i loved mabel how i had conquered my raging passion frank will surely applaud my resolution dear heart how wise he was in his loving simplicity i looked at the sealed letter it also was directed in his wife's handwriting i broke the seal and saw frank's writing there it was written therefore some time before his death how solemn the wind was through the willow boughs how solemn the faint sound of the swirls of the lowland river i read oh hugh hugh poor wounded heart i saw it all along that she was not worthy of that heart stored up with so much love i do not ask for that love dear friend i know you cannot give it to me i was never jealous of her and i know moreover that your love for her will not be wasted i think for my part that there is one who gathers up all such wandering love and keeps it for himself think you of those many weary hours on the cross in that way did they requite his love then and how do we requite it now should he not then sympathize with all those whose love is not returned and hugh sweet friend i pray you for christ's love never strive to forget the love you bore her in the days when you thought her noble the noblest of all things never cast away the gift of memory never cast it away for your ease never even for the better serving of god he will help himself and does not want mere deeds you are weak and love cannot live without memory oh hugh if you do as i pray you this remembered love will be a very bright crown to you up in heaven meantime may it not be that your love for others will grow that you will love all men more and me perhaps even much more and i though i never see you again in the body till the day of doom will nevertheless be near you in spirit to comfort you somewhat through the days of your toiling on earth and now frank praise god to bless poor wounded hugh i ceased reading a dull pain came about my forehead and eyes what 
must i be all alone in my struggle with passion not even frank to help me dear fellow to think how fond he was of me i am very very sorry he cannot be with me in this fight for i must kill her utterly in my memory and i think if he knew all how very noble i thought her how altogether base she really is he would be with me after all yet frank though i do not do this that you pray me to do you shall still be my friend will you not you shall help me to become more like you if that is possible in any degree so i determined to forget her and was i not successful at first ah and for long too nevertheless alas alas frank's memory faded with her memory and i did not feel his spirit by me often only sometimes and those were my weakest times when i was least fit to have him by me for then my purpose would give in somewhat and a memory would come to me not clear and distinct but only as a dull pain about my eyes and forehead but my strong will could banish that for i had much work to do trying to help my fellow-men with all my heart i thought i threw myself heart and soul into that work and joy grew up in my soul and i was proud to think that she had not exhausted the world for me nor did i shrink once from the sight of her but came often and saw her at her father's house at riston that the broadening river flows by always nay i sat at her wedding and saw her go up to the altar with firm step and heard her say her parts in the unfaltering music of her rich voice wherein was neither doubt nor love and there i prayed that the brave noble-hearted soldier her husband might be happy with her feeling no jealousy of him pitying him rather for i did not think that it was in her nature to love any one but herself thoroughly yet what a queen she looked on that marriage day her black hair crowning her so her great deep eyes looking so full of all slumbering passion as of old her full lips underneath whence the music came and as she walked there between the grey walls of that abbey where they were married the light fell on her through the jewel-like windows colouring strangely the white and gold of her gorgeous robes she also seemed or wished to seem to have forgotten that spring day at riston at least she spoke to me when she went away quite kindly and very calmly good-bye hugh we hear of you already you will be a great man soon and a good man you always were and always will be and we shall think of you often and always with pleasure yet i knew she hated me oh her hollow heart the dull pain came about my forehead and eyes somehow i could not keep up the farce just then i spoke bitterly a smile that i know now i should not have smiled curling my lip well done mabel it is a nicely composed parting speech to an old friend but you are always good at that kind of thing forget you no you are too handsome for that and if i were a painter or a sculptor i would paint you or carve you from memory as it is i never forget beautiful faces good-bye and i turned away from her a little without giving my hand she grew pale at first then flushed bright crimson like a stormy sky and turned from me with a scornful devil's glance she was gone and a sharp pang of memory shot through me for a single instant a warning of my fall which was to be for a single instant i saw her sitting there as of old in the garden hard by the river under the gold dropping laburnums heard her for a single instant singing wildly in her magnificent voice as of old wearily drearily half the day long flap the great banners high over the stone strangely and eerily sounds the wind's song bending the banner poles while all alone watching the loopholes spark like eye with life all dark feet tethered hands fettered fast to the stone the grim walls square lettered with prisoned men's groan still strain the banner poles through the wind's song westward the banner rolls over my wrong 
but it was gone directly that pang everything voice face and all like the topmost twigs of some great tree limb that as it rolls round and round grinding the gravel and mud at the bottom of a flooded river shows doubtfully for a second flashing wet in the february sunlight then sinking straightway goes rolling on toward the sea in the swift steady flow of the flooded river yet it appears again often till it is washed ashore at last who knows where or when but for me these pangs of memory did not come often nay they came less and less frequently for long till at last in full triumph as i thought it i fell that marriage day was more than two years after the day in april that i have told you of when i read the sealed letter then for three years after her marriage i went on working famous now with many who almost worshipped me for the words i had said the many things i had taught them and i in return verily loved these earnestly yet round about me clung some shadow that was not the mere dulled memory of what had been and it deepened sometimes in my drearier moods into fearful doubts that this last five years of my life had been after all a mistake a miserable failure yet still i had too much to do to go on doubting for long so these shadowy doubts had to hold back till though i knew it not a whole army of them was marching upon me in my fancied security well it was springtime just about five years from that day i was living in london and for the last few months had been working very hard indeed writing and reading all day long and every day often all night long also and in those nights the hours would pass so quickly that the time between nightfall and dawn scarcely seemed ten minutes long so i worked worked so hard that one day one morning early when i saw through my window on waking about six o'clock how blue the sky was even above the london roofs and remembered how in the fields all about it was the cowslip time of the year i said to myself no work to-day i will make holiday for once in the sweet spring time i will take a book with some tale in it go into the country and read it there not striving particularly to remember it but enjoying myself only and as i said this my heart beat with joy like a boy's at the thought of holiday so i got up and as i was dressing i took up a volume of shakespeare and opened it at troilus and cressida and read a line or two just at the place where the parting comes it almost brought the tears to my eyes how soft-hearted i am this morning i said yet i will take this and read it it is quite a long time since i read any shakespeare and i think years and years since i have read troilus and cressida yes i was soft-hearted that morning and when i looked in the glass and saw my puny deformed figure there and my sallow thin face eaten into many furrows by those five years those furrows that gave a strange grotesque piteousness to the ugly features i smiled at first then almost wept for self-pity the tears were in my eyes again but i thought i will not spoil my holiday and so forbore then i went out into the streets with a certain kind of light-heartedness which i knew might turn at any moment into very deep sadness the bells of a church that i passed in my way essexward were ringing and their music struck upon my heart so that i walked the faster to get beyond their sound i was in the country soon people called it an ugly country i knew that spreading of the broad marshlands round the river lee but i was so weary with my hard work that it seemed very lovely to me then indeed i think i should not have despised it at any time i was always a lover of the sad lowland country i walked on my mind keeping up a strange balance between joy and sadness for some time till gradually all the beauty of things seemed to be stealing into my heart and making me very soft and womanish so that at last when i was now quite a long way off from the river lee and walking close to the side of another little river a mere brook 
all my heart was filled with sadness and joy had no place there at all all the songs of birds ringing through the hedges and about the willows all the sweet colours of the sky and the clouds that floated in the blue of it of the tender fresh grass and the sweet young shoots of flowering things were very pensive to me pleasantly so at first perhaps but soon they were lying heavy on me with all the rest of things created for within my heart rose memory green and fresh as the young spring leaves ah such thoughts of the old times came about me thronging that they almost made me faint i tried hard to shake them off i noticed every turn of the banks of the little brook every ripple of its waters over the brown stones every line of the broad-leaved water-flowers i went down towards the brook and stooping down gathered a knot of lush marsh marigolds then kneeling on both knees bent over the water with my arm stretched down to it till both my hand and the yellow flowers were making the swift running little stream bubble about them and even as i did so still stronger and stronger came the memories till they came quite clear at last those shapes and words of the past days i rose from the water in haste and getting on to the road again walked along tremblingly my head bent toward the earth my wet hand and flowers marking the dust of it as i went ah what was it all that picture of the old past days i see a little girl sitting on the grass beneath the limes in the hot summer tide with eyes fixed on the far away blue hills and seeing who knows what shapes there for the boy by her side is reading to her wondrous stories of knight and lady and fairy thing that lived in the ancient days his voice trembles as he reads and so sir isumbras when he had slain the giant cut off his head and came to the town where the lady alicia lived bringing with him that grim thing the giant's head and the people pressed all about him at the gate and brought him to the king and all the court was there and the whole palace blazed with gold and jewels so there among the ladies was the lady alicia clothed in black because she thought that through her evil pride she had caused the death of the good knight and true who loved her and when she saw sir isumbras with the head of the giant even before the king and all she gave a great cry and ran before all and threw her arms round about him go on hugh says the little girl still looking into the blue distance why do you stop i was i was looking at the picture mabel says the boy oh is there a picture of that let's see it and her eyes turned towards him at last what a very beautiful child she is not exactly of that says hugh blushing as their eyes meet and when she looks away for a second drawing his hand across his eyes for he is soft-hearted not exactly of that but afterwards where she crowns him at the tournament here it is oh that is pretty though hugh i say hugh yes says hugh go and get me some of the forget-me-not down by the brook there and some of the pretty white star-shaped flower i'll crown you too off runs hugh directly carrying the book with him stop don't lose the place hugh here give me the book back he goes then starts again in a great hurry the flowers are not easy to get but they are got somehow for hugh though deformed is yet tolerably active and for her so when the flowers come she weaves them into a crown blue flowers golden-hearted and white ones star-shaped with the green leaves between them then she makes him kneel down and looking at the picture in the fairy story book places him this way and that with her smooth brows knit into a puzzled frown at last she says it won't do somehow i can't make it out i say you she blurts out at last i tell you what it won't do you are too ugly never mind mabel he says shall i go on reading again yes you may go on then she sits down 
and again her eyes are fixed on the far away blue hills and hugh is by her reading again only stumbling sometimes seemingly not so much interested as he was before poor hugh i say aloud for strangely the thing was so strong that it had almost wrought its own cure and i found myself looking at my old self and at her as at people in a story yet i was stunned as it were and knew well that i was incapable of resistance against that memory now yes i knew well what was coming i had by this time left the brook and gone through a little village on the hill above and on the other side of it then turned to my right into the forest that was all about the quaint hornbeam forest there sitting down i took out the troilus and cressida i had brought with me and began to read saying to myself though i did not believe it that i would cast these memories quite away from me be triumphantly victorious over them yes there under the hornbeams i read troilus and cressida the play with the two disappointments in it hector dead and cressida unfaithful troy and troilus undone and when i had finished i thought no more of troilus and cressida or of any one else in the wild world but mabel oh mabel i said burying my face in the grass as i had before long ago in her long robes oh mabel could you not have loved me i would have loved you more than any woman was ever loved or if you could not love me why did you speak as you did on that day i thought you so much above me mabel and yet i could not have spoken so to any one oh mabel how will it be between us when we are dead oh lord help me help me is it coming over again for as i lay there i saw again as clearly as years ago the room in the old house at riston at the noontide of the warm sunny spring weather the black oak panelling carved so quaintly all round the room whereon in the space of sunlight that pouring through the window lit up the shadowed wall danced the shadows of the young lime leaves the great bay window with its shattered stone mullions round which the creepers clung the rustling of the hard magnolia leaves in the fresh blast of the west wind the garden with its clusters of joyous golden daffodils under the acacia trees seen through the open window and beyond that rolling and flashing in the sun between its long lines of willows and poplars the mighty lowland river going to the sea and she sat there by the fireplace where there was no fire burning now she sat by the cold hearth with her back to the window her long hands laid on her knees bending forward a little as if she were striving to look through and through something that was far off there she sat with her heavy rolling purple hair like a queen's crown above her white temples with her great slumberously passionate eyes and her full lips underneath whence the music came except that the wind moved a little some of the folds of her dress she was as motionless and quiet as an old egyptian statue sitting out in its many thousand years of utter rest that it may the better ponder on its own greatness more lifeless by far she looked than any one of the grey saints that hang through rain and wind and sunshine in the porches of the abbey which looks down on the low river waves and there was one watched her from near the door a man with long arms crooked shoulders and pale ugly featured face looking out from long lank black hair yes his face is pale always but now it is much paler than usual as pale almost as the face of a dead man you can almost hear his heart beat as he stands there the cold sweat gathers on his brow presently he moves towards the lady he stands before her with one hand raised and resting on the mantel shelf you can see his arm trembling as he does this he stands so while you might count twenty she never looking up the while then half choking he says mabel i want to speak to you if you please for a moment and she looks round with a calm unconcerned look at first 
but presently a scornful smile begins to flicker about the corners of her mouth then that pale man says ah i have told you all the rest before for he knew the meaning of the flickering smile and that was five years ago and i shall never forget it while i live never forget those words of hers never forget a single line of, of her beautiful cruel face as she stood there five years ago all the world may go by me now i care not i cannot work any more i think i must have had some purpose in coming here but i forget what it was i will go back to london and see if i can remember when i get there so that day under the hornbeam trees i fell from my steady purpose of five years i was vanquished then once and for ever there was no more fighting for me any more and have i ever forgotten it that day and the word she spoke no not for one moment i have lived three years since then of bitter anguish every moment of that time has been utter pain and woe to me that is what my life has been these three years and what death may be like i cannot tell i dare not even think for fear and i have fled from the world no one of all my worshippers knows what has become of me and the people with whom i live now call me a man without a purpose without a will yes i wonder what death would be like the ure is deep at louvier i know deep and runs very swiftly towards the seine past the cloth mills louvier louvier what am i saying where am i oh christ i hold the sealed letter frank sealed letter in my hand the seal just broken five years eight years it was but two hours ago that my head lay before her feet yet i seem to have lived those eight years then i have not been famous have not forgotten never sat under the hornbeams by chigwell and she is sitting there still perhaps in that same oak room how strange it is fearfully strange yet true for here is frank's letter here is his manuscript the ink on it brown through the years of toil and longing there close by my side the great river is going to the sea and the wind goes softly through the willow boughs this sunny spring afternoon and now what shall i do i know my will is strong though i failed so in that dream i have awoke from i know too that a sorrow's crown of sorrow is remembering happier things shall i wear this crown then while i live on earth or forget and be brave and strong ah it must be a grand thing to be crowned and if it cannot be with golden jewels or better still with the river flowers then must it be with thorns shall i wear this or cast it from me i hear the wind going through the willow boughs it seems to have a message for me good and true faithful and brave loving always and crowned with all wisdom in the days gone by he was all this and more trust your friend hugh your friend who loved you so though you hardly knew it wear the crown of memory yes i will wear it and o oh friend you who sent me this dream of good and evil help me i pray you for i know how bitter it will be yes i will wear it and then though never forgetting mabel and the other things that have been i may be happy at some time or another yet i cannot see now how that can ever come to pass oh mabel if you could only have loved me lord keep my memory green end of frank's sealed letter by william morris end of part three